This morning I'd like to introduce you to the fifth way of Jesus, his teachings. And I thought, what's more appropriate to look at the teachings of Jesus than to look at the subject of baptism today. And so I want to share with you just a couple passages this morning on the subject of baptism. Uh, because we want to be able to follow the way of Jesus. The Christian life is not one where we get to decide what we want to do with our lives. The Christian life is one that is surrendered to God. The Christian life is not one where we get to choose who we want to become. It is one where we surrender it so we become who God wants us to be. The Christian life is, is, about, is about recognizing that God knows who you are, is trying to tell you who you are, and has this amazing plan to help develop you to become more like Jesus. And it's going to have these great times, and it's going to have some hard times. Guaranteed. But it's a life led by God. Where you're not alone in it. Have you ever gone to, uh, had a new job, I should say. And uh, you went to work for the, the first day you were at this new job. And, and have you ever been there and they trained you how to do the job? Yes. Have you ever been there at a time when you felt like you needed somebody to tell you what to do and to train you? And you were kind of stumbling around and wondering, what do I do? It's kind of like when I get in the kitchen to do dishes. How do I do this? I don't know what to do. No, I'm kidding. I've done dishes plenty in my life. But you know what it's like when you're trying to do something and you don't know how to do it. The Christian life is one where you will always have God with you leading the way. And as we follow in that way, I believe that you are the way the truth and the life. And as we follow that way, the truth and the life, we, we recognize that his teachings become so central to us. I mean, that's why we want to keep encouraging people to read their Bibles, to memorize scripture. It isn't so that you can become smart. It's so that you can become more like Jesus. It's so that you can become who you were always meant to be. And so today, I want to bring you to our first text, which is Mark chapter 1, verse 5. And in Mark 1, 5, it says this. People from Jerusalem and from all over Judea traveled out in the wilderness to see and hear John. And this was John the Baptist referring to. And when they confessed their sins, he baptized them in the Jordan River. One of the, the, the tenets behind baptism is repentance. It always has been. Repentance isn't about changing actions and words first and foremost. It's actually about changing your mind. Repentance literally means that it's about changing your mind. And that's why it's so important for us to, to look at the teachings of Jesus, the way of Jesus and his teachings, because they will change your mind on how to live, on how to speak, and how to treat people. And repentance uh, is intricately connected to baptism. It's not that you get baptized so that you could repent. It's you repent and then you get baptized. You change your mind about life. You change your mind about, about recognizing who God is. And that God died for you. And wants you to live with him forever. And when you change your mind, and you say, I can accept that, then other things start to change. How we live. And we, we've looked at, uh, well, this is the fifth uh, marker of Jesus, we've looked at Jesus' life. And we're, we're looking at his life and say, how did Jesus live? And then we look at Jesus' mission. And you say, well, Jesus was on mission to be able to, to spread the good news about himself and the kingdom of God. We join in with Jesus on that same mission. Then we looked at uh, Jesus' character. And we looked at the attitude, behavior, and character that Jesus had. And we say, we need to have the same attitude, behavior, and character as Jesus. And then fourth, we looked at Jesus' love. That agape love that's an unconditional love. And we say, you know what? We need to practice that unconditional love. Not just to people that we like. 
but to people who are our enemies. And today we're looking at the teachings of Jesus in the subject of baptism. And baptism is all about the fact that these five people have changed their mind about how they want to live and have turned and are facing Jesus and saying, I'm with you because you were for me. I will stay with you because you stay with me. I will live for you because you lived and died for me. And so when John baptized, he, and, and Jesus came along and he was baptized by John, it wasn't that Jesus needed to repent of sinful ideas or beliefs or actions. It was that he was actually making a change. It was living a life where he was working as a carpenter, probably with his father Joseph, and this was the beginning of his ministry, was his baptism. It was making that significant shift, that repentance, if you will, to say, I am now going to start this ministry. And what do we see happen? We see as Jesus came out of the water, the Spirit of God descended upon him like a dove. And we see the Father saying, this is my Son. We see that the Father, Son, Spirit, the three in one that we have just sung about in one of our songs, was declared and revealed to us. And it is this Son who continued on in that ministry after he was baptized. And we join in with Jesus' baptism to say we are repenting, we, we are changing, and baptism in the waters is, is saying, I'm following Christ. What, and they get baptized because Jesus did. And that my life it is about working and serving and having a ministry to honor him in everything I do. The second text that we're looking at today is from Acts chapter 18. Uh, verse 8, if you'd like to flip over there. The first text was about repentance. Now, the three texts I'm going to talk about here right away are, are all connected very much. Well, notice repentance is the theme in Mark chapter 1, verse 5. In 18, uh, Acts 18, verse 8, it says, Crispus, the leader of the synagogue, which is really neat that this Jewish leader uh, became, uh, became a Christian, and all his household believed in the Lord. Many others in Corinth also became believers and were baptized. What we see here as a prerequisite to being baptized, something that has to happen before you get baptized, is you have to believe. Their households believed. And then they were baptized. It wasn't a baptism and then believe. It wasn't a baptism and then you were saved. It was that you had repentance, you believed, you were saved, and then you get baptized. We want to remember this, uh, th this theme that, that the change of the inward, invisible work of God changed us before the visible rite and practice of baptism. This is a sign of what has already happened in the lives and the souls of these five people today. That they are cleansed by the blood of Jesus, as Matthew testified in our sharing of prayer. And then through the resurrection, they have eternal life. In Galatians chapter 3, if you'd like to turn over to Galatians, Galatians, there we go. Chapter 3, beginning at verse 26, it says, So you are all children of God, through faith in Christ Jesus. It's important. It's through faith. And all who have been united with Christ in baptism have been made like Him. The first text was about repentance. The second text was about belief. The third text is using a different word, is about faith. Faith is in the lives of these people. That their faith is alive and well. That they are sealed by the Spirit of God. That they are going to heaven. And right now, they enjoy the presence and the comfort of the Spirit of God in their lives. As are you. 
And so we see this, this, this threefold language of repentance and belief and, and faith being worked together to, to, to say something of what's already happened in the lives of people before they even get to the waters. One of the things that we want to remember this morning is, is about um, it is about this faith, is about this belief, is about this repentance. But it's the fact that we don't want to forget. And that's where I, I want to link together the baptism and the Lord's Supper. Next week we are going to have communion here. I figured out a way to have a COVID-friendly way of having communion, which Donna and Dave do not have to prepare the elements for. I've already taken care of that. So it's it's all good. We'll, we'll be able to, it'll be a little different, but it's COVID friendly. And it's and when we think about the Lord's table, it, we in the very front of you will notice it says the word remembrance. We don't want to forget. The gospel of Jesus is something we don't want to forget. That the gospel is for those who are lost sheep and need to be found. The gospel is also for those who are not lost. It is for you as well. The gospel is something that, that is, it is a message to tell people they don't have to live in sin and in, in a state of being an enemy of God. It, it's a message to say that God exists. It's a message to say that God is taking care of the problem of sin in this world, which the world doesn't have an answer for. But God does. And this gospel can help tra the transform them. They just need to repent, believe, and receive the gift of faith. And we bring that gospel message here and we say that's what communion is about. We want to remember what Jesus has done. The, 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 the debt that Jesus paid. That's the thing about forgiveness is that forgiveness is the cancellation of the debt. But that cancellation of that debt does not happen prematurely. It happens when we repent. It happens when we believe, when we want to be reconciled to God, when we choose that. That's when we're forgiven. Otherwise, our sins are still held against us. But when we choose the path of reconciliation with God, we repent, we believe, we give in faith, we are forgiven, and we want to remember. And that's what communion is about. It is, it's something that we get to do often. It is a continual thing we get to do. As often as you do this, the Apostle Paul says in 1 Corinthians 11, do this in remembrance of me in Jesus' words. As they were partaking of the Passover supper. And you might remember the Passover supper. It is it's to commemorate and to remember. And they were doing this for a long time to remember how God saved them from slavery in Egypt. Which is like a picture of sin. We're enslaved to sin. But it was through the blood of the sacrifice that they painted on the, on the door frames and on the windows. And God passed over those homes so that the curse of the death wouldn't hit them. And they commemorated and they remembered this because it, led, it was the tenth plague and it led them into, into uh, the pharaohs saying, fine, go, get out of here. They found freedom through that. And Jesus capitalized on this Passover meal and he tied it directly to him that he becomes our Passover lamb. It is his blood that washes us clean so that the wrath of God passes over us and that we become friends with God. We want to remember that gospel message that is embedded in communion as we remember the waters of baptism. Because that same gospel message is being proclaimed through the testimony every time somebody gets into those waters. Baptism is not something that we do continually. It is something that happens once in your life. Communion is something we do often, lest we forget Baptism is, is a one-time deal. It is, it is to reveal to you the work and the sealing power of the Spirit of God because they have been transformed by the gospel.
And so we want to remember that the five who were baptized today had already repented. They had already believed. They already had been given the gift of faith by God, as we see in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8 and 9. And today, they took the step of faith and obedience to follow in the path of Jesus to be baptized as a testimony to you. They are testifying to you. They're living for Christ. They want you to know that they are followers of Jesus. Today I'm going to end my message just with a call for all of us to recognize just how much we need the Lord. We declare our faith through our words, through our actions in our lives. We do it through baptism. We do it through the Lord's Supper. We do it in so many different ways, but we must never forget that we can't do this on our own and in our own strength. These baptism waters aren't about, uh, about saving people. They are about showing you that they are saved that they were washed and cleansed already, and that they're heaven bound for an eternal life of peace and of happiness and joy with God. But we can't keep living this life the way of Jesus on our own. We can't keep doing it in our own strength. I know I say that a lot, and we hear Christians talk about that a lot. Don't do it in your own strength. There is something absolutely essential to the Christian life. It's humility. It is a deep, profound sense of humility. Not humiliation, humility. We are not here beating people down. We are here encouraging people to recognize that we follow the way, the truth, and the life. We need to cry out to God and say, Lord, I need you. Every day, every hour, I need you. Please pray with me. I'm going to invite our worship team to come up and lead us in our last song. Father, we celebrate the gift of faith you have given everyone here. We celebrate their baptisms. We celebrate the times they've had communion. We celebrate the times as they continue to grow. We celebrate that your presence is with all of these people here. We celebrate their, the goodness, the journey, and the transformation you continue to do in their life. And we, in humility, cry out to you.